think there's three possibilities. Possibility A is that you have a professional interest in this topic because you are a counselor or you work in social services in some way. Option B is that you, uh, you're you just kind of a person who's interested in lots of different things and you thought you'd come and check it out. Option C is you're a freaked out parent. And you, don't, you wonder what to do about the, the increasing amount of screen time that your kids and your kids' friends are spending and what to do about that and how to deal with those kinds of scenarios. So among those three possibilities, is there anybody that I missed? Okay, that's good to know. Let, let's, let's spend one minute on specifics so that as I go on tonight, I can tailor my presentation to what you came specifically to find out about. I figured I might talk for, I don't know, 55 minutes or so, till, till about 8 o'clock. And then uh, we could have some, some conversation and some questions sort of up until about 8.30. So as, as I go, make sure you make note of further questions as they arise for you. But before I get underway, what specifically do you need? Especially for parents. Specifically. Yeah. Um, I like some ideas because I've always tried to raise my son that he makes choices that make sense and I make him responsible for those choices. And right now he's in a serious situation. Uh, how old is he? Fifteen. Yeah, yeah. That's the trouble, right? You want to empower your kids, you want to give them a sense of autonomy and responsibility, and what do they do with it? They become tech addicts. Yeah. How many people have that situation? Young person that you think is addicted in some way to technology, games too much, spends, spends, stays up too late, or gets too involved, or gets distracted from schoolwork. That was about five or six hands that went up. When I asked young people this question, kids who are 15 to 20 or so, I asked them, how many of you are addicted to technology and stay up late and sacrifice schoolwork? About 90% of them put up their hand. So they're much more in tune with this problem than we as parents and adults are. I mean, part of the problem is this that most, most parents, most people in this room were born before 1990. 1990 is really the dividing line for web immersion. Kids who are born after 1990, they grew up with the web, they grew up with these technologies, they, they grew up with gaming, and it's kind of built into their childhood development. And so, so for them, it's not something you can just extract. It's part of their culture. But for us, it's not. We don't get it. We don't know how to program a VCR, for heaven's sake. So, <laughs> so we're pretty stuck. You know, and, and we see all this happening, we don't know how to deal with it, we don't know how to get involved, we don't really want to get involved. And so the mentorship roles that adults used to play in the lives of young people around this issue have kind of disappeared because we've opted out. I'll, I'll talk more about that later. But the question of what to do with the 15 year old is a particularly dicey question because that's the, that's the most difficult age actually for this. Okay, what else specifically? How much is too much? How much is too much? <laughs> well, you know, you know, because it's just yeah. so easy. It's a slippery slope. Right? Way less than you think is too much. <laughs> I'll give you some stats later. The average young person in Canada spends something like 40 or 50 hours a week in front of a screen. So that's more time than any other activity except sleeping. And uh, that's that's a big problem. That's about 10 times what they should be spending. Okay, any other specifics? So you want to know specifically how much screen time, specifically how to deal with it's a 15 year old problem. And one final one. How to, how to get them off. <laughs> how to get them off. Without getting into a big argument. Yeah. This is a nervous system problem, actually. I mean, yeah. when, when a young person is, is highly engaged in an immersive game or, or a social media environment that, that really pulls them in and draws them in, they, they, their nervous system gets activated quite strongly. And uh, the, the interaction is between their nervous system and the machine. If a parent comes in and tries to break that connection, especially with high intensity gaming, the, the nervous system intensity of the child gets transferred to the parent. So that's that's when parents get beat up or kids walk out or you know there's some kind of disaster. So how to avoid that? We'll talk about that. Okay. Let me also say just well, about uh, if you can continue in the evening around how that is elevating the the anxiety rate absolutely. with with young people, and also the whole aspect of, of um, uh, social anxiety, that somehow when kids are having trouble being with their peers, that somehow this is replacing it, that they are getting to feel like they're engaged with people, but it's through, yeah. it's this anonymous engagement. Yes, and this is an important point to get. 
for us. We see this technological communication among young people as being ridiculous and superficial in some way. That is not how they see it. And we have to get that at some point. We, we cannot continue to place our expectations about how communication works on young people for whom the style is a little bit different. A good chunk of their interpersonal communication happens through technology. And we just have to get used to that. And not, and not continue to try to push them into other kinds of things that, that they will do a little bit, but their cultural norms, their cultural practices are deeply embedded in technology. We need to be more aware of that rather than just trying to shut it down all the time. So I'll say something about that. Okay, two final resource-based things. One is that uh, you don't need to take notes because this is all online. The wonders of technology. The slideshow that I'm using is online, um, and also the resources, uh, the written out portion of the presentation is also online, and here's how you get it. You can go to my website which is just rosslaird.com. You click on this thing, it says for parents. And that'll bring up a link. The internet is really slow here. This page took like five minutes to load. So it may be five minutes before this page comes up. But on that page that comes up, there's a series of articles that are for parents about this whole question. And probably the second one, I think, is, is on this specific issue of technology pictures. You'll find it there. If you can't find it, there's a contact link <coughs> on every single page. There we go. So there's a thing on marijuana. Marijuana and technology are connected, by the way. We have the highest rates of marijuana use in the world here in BC. And that's another thing we should start to really think about more seriously. We spend a lot of time talking about drugs and alcohol in a general kind of way, and alcohol in particular. But the biggest social, the biggest addiction problem among youth is marijuana. Absolutely, no question about it. So there's an article on that. But, uh, and some suggestions for parents who have a child with an addiction. Um, and here's the one for the presentation today. Parenting, addictions, and technology. And the other ones are related, of course. Okay. Let's see how far we get in an hour. Or a little bit under an hour. Okay. Hard talk about that. So, <clears throat> this is where we are, right? The giant wave of technology is crashing over us, and we are ill-prepared to deal with it. Young people are so immersed in this kind of stuff. And we're in this little boat right here, trying to cope with and deal with this avalanche of stuff that's just racing towards and transforming all of culture. We are, those of us who were born before 1990, we are the last generation of people in the West who grew up in a kind of um, traditional and organic way. Everybody from, from now forward grows up with technology as foundational. And that's, that's the biggest problem we have. The, the, the fact that we don't get it, the fact that we opt out, the fact that we don't want to game with our kids, for example, if they're gamers, the fact that we don't want to go on Facebook. Who has a Facebook account, by the way? Look at that, eh? I don't. And I'm proud of it. Here, I mean, for, for 100,000 years of the human evolution, it looked a certain way, which is that parents had undergone essentially the same kinds of experiences as their kids. So when their kids got to a certain age, the parents could provide some insight, teachers could provide some insight, mentors, church leaders could provide some insight into the things kids were going through and could help them. They were part of that kind of circularity of wisdom sharing. That has disappeared. In the last decade, that's disappeared. Because the primary challenges kids face today, the ways they navigate their relationships with one another, their activities, Almost all of childhood development now, development now is wrapped up in technology, and we've just opted out. We've said, you know what, I just don't get it. I just want you to get off the computer, but I don't know what you're doing when you're on the computer. And so the mentorship opportunities that used to be available to kids from their parents have now essentially vanished. And the one thing that kids need more than any other single thing from parents and members in the community is mentorship. So it's the mentorship vacuum that's the main issue. And I'll try to get far enough down this track to say something about practical suggestions for mentorship a bit later on. But I think we should bear in mind that this, this issue is not really about technology. Technology is not inherently good or bad. Technology is just something that we're with now. The, pro the essential problem is the disconnect between generations around technology and our lack of buy-in, our lack of ability to find ways that we can fruitfully and usefully use this technology and enter into the culture of young people to help them with whatever it is that they face. That's the problem. And in, in our absence, young people are figuring it out on their own. When I do groups with kids, man, they're very insightful.
insightful about this. They, they, don't, they don't have any illusions about where technology works and where it doesn't. They're not at all confused about the fact that they spend too much time on screens. They are, they are really tuned in to this problem in a social way. And they're quite proactive about trying to change this. It's just that they don't have any resources. They don't get any help from parents and teachers and other people. They're kind of left on their own to figure this out. And they are doing so. This, this last six months or so um, has seen, in my experience working with young people, has seen a whole a dramatic increase in the number of young people who are getting off social media, for example, closing their Facebook accounts. Lots, lots of young people have done that recently. They, they've just tried to figure it out and make it work for themselves. And I think that that's a good thing, but I think we can be much more involved, obviously. Um, if you think about what, what the ideal childhood is or what the ideal youth experience is, in your own mind about the kinds of experiences we want for children, um, given the internet here, I don't know that this is going to play. You can watch it on the site, because it's only about the site. Yeah, I'm going to skip it. Okay. Pause it. Okay. Basically, what the video says is that. That's what we want, right? We want this sense of self-awareness for young people, interpersonal development, their sense of empathy, their ability to deal with other people, character development, all those kinds of things, that core of human development that is so important for us, and, and for them as well. That's what we want for them, and that's not really what they're getting, right? What we have is this, 40 or 50 hours a week for young people, right? Unbelievable amounts of gear and time. And the overweight and obesity problem that so many young people face now, 30% of kids. Now the video's playing. <laughs> I know, that's true. Well, now it's stopping. This is a video made by uh, a couple of guys, uh, 18, 19 year old kids, who uh, went on a trip with a video camera and they made three videos about the experience of being in the world and being an old citizen. Now I'm just going to go back to where I was. Rates of hypertension, illness, all kinds of issues. Association with ADHD. Here's a thing. Every hour of TV that kids watch under three increases their risk of getting an ADHD diagnosis in adolescence by 10%, which is kind of freaky, because your average two-year-old is watching four or five hours of television a day, right? So that's, you know, 40 or 50% greater risk. This does not imply or mean that watching television causes ADHD, but if you want to do, if you have young kids, and you want to do one thing to have the greatest possible impact on their childhood development with regard to technology, it should be this. No screen time, three or under. Zero. Zero screen time. Which is just ridiculous given the situation that we have, right? People are, people are showing their six-month-old kids, you know, baby Einstein on the computer. You know baby Einstein? The research has shown that kids who use baby Einstein learn on average seven fewer words per day than kids who don't use Baby Einstein. So Baby Einstein makes you stupider. <laughs> but, and when this research came out, Disney, that owns, who owns Baby Einstein, they threatened to sue the researchers if they released this. It was a whole interesting process. But basically, it's been shown quite conclusively that as much as possible, very young children should have no screen time. And that kids who are a little older, say age three to five-ish, they can have maybe five, 10 minutes a day. Like the amount, some of these short cartoons on television are five, 10 minutes long. That seems reasonable. That is dramatically less than what most kids are getting. Especially now that everybody has a DVD player in the car. When I was a kid, when you were a kid, you know, one of the ways that you learn self-regulation, which is the most important interpersonal skill of all, actually, one of the ways you learn self-regulation was by going on a road trip with your parents in the car, right? Sit in the back there with your siblings, or whoever, by yourself, if you're an only child, and you fight, you, you joust, you hit each other, you make up songs. If, if you're going all the way to Edmonton on this road trip, you know, you're 14 hours in, you have to figure it out. You have to deal with boredom. You have to deal with being together in a non-distracted way. Now, I get it from the point of view of parents that it's easier to put the DVD player on and the kids are quiet, it's probably safer in the car as a driver, right? You're not looking back all the time.
But one of the, this is a simple example of how we have removed from the childhood development experience an essential opportunity for skill development for young people. That's how kids learn to deal with boredom. That's how they learn self-regulation, is by sitting in an enclosed space where they have no distractions available to them, and they have to be with themselves and be with other people. That is such a foundational skill. And so many young people just simply do not have that skill today because everywhere they go, there's always a distraction available to them. That's a problem. Okay, and this freaks us out, right? This makes you feel like the, the screen, that painting by Edward Munch, that, that somehow this is a runaway train and it's very difficult to know what to do about it. And the option of just removing all technology seems unwise, as it is. And the option of always being intervening and supervising and being on it all the time seems exhausting. And then when you add to that the reality that many, many parents are also technology addicted. Lots of us are. You know, the, uh, the dinner table, the average dinner table these days, family dinner table, has dad with a Blackberry, mom with the iPhone, and kids with DSs, right? That's what they do. And everybody, you see this when you go to a restaurant these days, right? You see the little family sitting on, everybody has a device, and nobody is talking. It's been shown, as I'm sure you know, that families who eat meals together, they do nothing else but just eat meals together. They have a greater degree of mental health than families who don't eat meals together. And it turns out, when you eat the meal together, you don't even have to get along. You don't have to even like the person that you're having the meal with. You can have a good old-fashioned fight at the meal, and your mental health is still better. It's bizarre. The simple act of getting together and doing something as a family is important, is foundational. In Canada, the stats about family time are kind of sobering. The average mom in Canada spends three and a half minutes per day interacting with her children on non-task related items. Lots of interaction around pick up your clothes and clean your room, but three and a half minutes of interaction on how you feeling, how was your day, right? Dads, as you'd expect, fare a little bit less well. For dads, it's 90 seconds per day. So we know from childhood development that young kids need about an hour a day of conversation to figure out the day, to work on all kinds of details. Tell me how your day went. It's a lot of time, right? So families that used to spend time together and eat meals together, that adds up to at least an hour a day, probably a couple of hours a day of time spent together. <coughs> a lot of this is about that. We, we have families now where both parents work. Kids go to school. They don't eat breakfast together. They can't eat lunch together. They might eat dinner together a bit later. But there's, in the meantime, this two or three hours where the kids are at home without the parents. And they're on the, you know, they're on the TV, they're on the technology, or whatever it is. And so this kind of ramps up pretty quickly and gets out of hand. I, I dealt with a situation last year where the parents worked, and the kids were at home by themselves from 3.15 to 6 o'clock. And the parents started to worry about the computer use of the kids. So the parents installed key logging software on the family computer. This is a cautionary tale, by the way, uh, but why not to do this? So the day after the parents installed the key logging software, the kids discovered the key logging software. These kids are 13 and 11, right? They discovered the key logging software and they turned it around on the parents. So the next day when the mom went on the computer to do some online banking, her keystrokes were logged and the kids got the passwords for the credit cards and the, you know, the banking information. And the day after that, the kids went on the computer and went on a $17,000 shopping spree, right? So, <laughs> you can't, that's a, good, that's a point here. You can't stay ahead of your kids. You cannot do it. They, they know, they know how to use Google, right? They know how to go to Google and type in, how do I turn around the key logging software so that I track my parents instead of them tracking me? Enter, right? They know how to do that. It's not that hard, right? Okay. So, I mean, this, uh, I apologize for the technology here. The screen is cutting off the top of the title of every slide. It's not supposed to do that, but it's scrunching things down, but you can still read it, right? So, ask yourself some questions here. How often do you use a digital device at the dinner table? If you do, you should think about that. And think about how difficult it might be for you to stop doing that. And just put the device away for that period. 
if, if you're in the habit of this, you may find it's extraordinarily difficult actually not to do it. It just becomes, it's addictive. And we don't like to think of addiction in this way. We like to think of addiction <laughs> like as, you know, heroin addicts on the downtown east side, that kind of, we tend to put addiction over there in some highly disruptive, non-functional camp, right? Addiction is the most pervasive problem we have in the world, right? It's never going away. We're always going to have addiction. You're going to be addicted to pretty much anything. And everybody has addiction somewhere pretty close to them. Either a personal history, a family history, whatever it is, right? Addiction's everywhere. And I think we should start to think about technologies in the same way. It's very easy, and it happens very quickly to get addicted to technologies, especially handhelds. They're so, they're like, they're like, you know, perfect children. They notify us at the right time. They're quiet when we want them to be quiet. They give us lots of information. We can play with them. It's great, right? The, the association between technology and mental health is well known. It's probably one of the reasons you came. The link is this. A mental health challenge or an addiction is basically the same thing. It's basically a way of trying to resolve an emotional issue that's really difficult to resolve. So in the case of mental health with depression or anxiety, you get stuck inside this cycle that you can't get out of. In the case of addiction, you get stuck in this similar kind of cycle, but the substances or the behaviors kind of have the rhythm, make the rhythm of the cycle. But it's essentially the same dynamic. It's unfinished emotional stuff, stuff we can't resolve problems from the past or issues in our current lives. It's, it's just stuff that we can't seem to face fully and resolve. Everybody has stuff like this, right? Everybody has problems, everybody has issues. So, so we, we, we find these behaviors or these substances as a way to temporarily complete what we can't complete in any other way. So for example, with alcoholism, it's a <coughs> common example that I'm sure everyone's familiar with. Alcohol makes you feel empowered you feel strong and confident, as does cocaine. But to say specifically with alcohol, alcohol is like the power drug, right? So if you feel powerless in other ways in your life, you're actually more likely to pick up alcohol as a, as a, as a coping mechanism. So most alcoholics essentially feel that they have some kind of powerlessness going on in their lives. And the route to resolving alcoholism is, is not a biochemical route, it's the route of insight, the route of understanding that, that uh, addiction is, is a kind of symptom it's not the disease itself, it's a kind of symptom of something that underlies it. Same thing with technology. People who overuse technologies use those technologies to temporarily meet their emotional needs that they can't meet in any other way. So if you get addicted to, to online gaming, intense gaming, you, there's probably a situation there where that sense of empowerment or that sense of belonging or that sense of confidence you get from the gaming, you can't find out in your regular real life. So it's exactly the same kind of dynamic. And we will see in the next couple of years, what we've already seen now, a wholesale transference of addiction from the substance use world into the technology world. Technology is safer. You don't have to go out in the world. You don't have to go down to some street corner to get it. Um, technology is legal. Technology is in your house. Technology is essentially free if you've got these devices already or if they're in your family. So there's all kinds of advantages to using technology rather than using, some, say, crack cocaine. But there's no difference in nervous system activation. A highly intensive, immersive, ultra-violent video game can give you just as much nervous system activation as being on crack cocaine. No doubt about it. It's intense. So we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that because the pathway of delivery is different, it doesn't mean that the consequences are pathway of delivery is different but provides the same emotional arousal. We should be sensitive to that. Here's another tip from, the very, from near the beginning. I'll probably come back to this again. If you have a child of any age under 18, the second most important thing you can do is make sure that all computers in the family home are in open public spaces all the time. All the time. No child should ever have computer or a handheld device in their room at night on their own. That's basic. Here's why. The skill of self-regulation, which is the most important interpersonal skill of all, does not fully develop until after age 26. It's a biochemical thing that has to do with the way that the nervous system develops, and that 
spinal and nervous system development doesn't complete it until age 26, and self-regulation is the last thing that gets developed. This is why you see in particular young men, more than young women, take highly impulsive actions, right? Impulse control doesn't come until later. You take your average nine-year-old kid in Canada who has seen, already seen hardcore porn on the web, right? Your average eight-year-old in Canada has seen hardcore porn on the web. You have a device in the room. Let's say it's an iPod Touch, seemingly innocuous, innocent device, right? which is also a web browser. So they have this in their room. Somebody texts them after the lights are out and they're on their own. And they open the text and somebody has sent them something inappropriate. They click on it. They open it up. In the moment they see it, they recognize, oh, this is inappropriate. And then their second thought immediately is, oh crap, if my parents find out about this, they'll take away my device. So immediately there's a kind of furtiveness that gets developed. They're not searching for this stuff online. It comes to them. It's just out there, and it's all part of youth culture and technology culture and the, the web. It's, it's all part of that universe. You don't have to search it. It's right there. So they get involved in it on the first night. And the furtiveness is immediately implemented on the first night already. So they're not going to tell you about it. And there's no way for you to find out. So the next night, they have their computer, their, their iPod Touch in their room. And there's a kind of furtive impulse control thing that so many of us have, which is when we're doing something that we know is inappropriate, it becomes kind of a right? Especially among young people. So they go on and they do the same thing again, and they get in the habit. And it takes about a day for this to get solidified. And then usually, after a couple of weeks, you start to sense that something's up. You start that the child might be a little more tired, or they might be a little more remote. Or they might, their behavior shifts in some way, and you can feel it. You can feel something is off. And then it might take months until you, it all comes out in some way. You, you, they leave the device in the wrong place, or they leave a page, or I don't know what, but you find out about it. But by the time you find out about it, 150,000 little things have happened. And then how are you supposed to unwind all that stuff back to the beginning and say, holy smokes, you know, where did this all start? And how did it get out of hand so quickly? The web is fundamentally unlike other kinds of things. It gets out of hand really fast. The good thing is, the upside, is that in some ways it doesn't really matter when you get involved. Because it's pretty hard to avoid these kinds of things for most people, most families. Most families are going to have this situation. How many people have had this situation? Nobody. Nobody, wants Nobody will admit it. Why yeah. yeah. they don't know? Okay. I'll talk about how to help with it later. But this is the problem. Part of the problem is that this stuff can happen so quickly, and we don't we don't really recognize what's going on until it's not that it's too late. It's that it gets out of hand pretty fast. Same with online bullying. It used to be, it used to be that kids were bullied in the schoolyard, and. They get bullied and they come home and they have a black eye and the parents talk and they go to see the principal and there's this process and over the course of several days or weeks it evolves. Online bullying through Facebook ramps up in 15 minutes. You go from somebody saying something mildly offensive to somebody threatening to kill somebody in about 15 minutes. Right? There's actually a law for this. I can't remember the guy's name, but there's a law that says that the more likely the, more, the longer a, 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 an online thread goes on, the, the greater likelihood that um, one of the people in the conversation will call another person a Nazi. It's, it's called the Nazi law. Uh, but, but there's a way in which the speediness of online communications accelerates in a much greater fashion than anything that used to happen before. So by the time you hear about it, already there's, there's, there's 50, 100 comments on Facebook that have, and you have to wade through them all. It's, it's a nightmare. Also, education is being transformed by technology, as we know. The, the traditional school system is its going to die pretty quickly. Um, we're, we're not going to have the traditional school system in 10 or 20 years. Right? It's already on the way up. The, um, I was doing a presentation at the largest high school in BC a couple weeks ago. And they, I was asking how big they were, and they were 2,100 students, which is huge. And then I was also working with this online school in Surrey, that is now the largest high school in Surrey, and they have 2,000 students. So 
the online school, which started like two years ago, already is almost as big as the largest high school in the province. So kids are opting out of the school system in a big way. They're doing things on their own. I met with somebody today who's reinventing the education by starting their own school. There's lots of interesting stuff. Teachers, on the continuum of tech savviness, with the geeks up here, geeks, programmers, uh, web architects, uh, young people involved, involved in social media causes and political advocacy, they're all quite geeky. You go way down here, further and further down, eventually you get to you know farmers, you get to uh, doctors are further down, uh, and parents are down here somewhere. And then way down here, at the very, very bottom, essentially, you get to um, teachers. Teachers are, ge in general, the, the one of the least technologically savvy groups as, as, as professionals. They're, they're interested in personal, personal connection. They're not interested in technology as such. Some of the new younger teachers are interested in technology, but most teachers who've been in the system for quite a while, they don't, it's not their thing. It's not their thing and it, I, I get that. I get that. Teaching, authentic teaching really is about interpersonal connection. It's not really about <laughs> distance stuff. So I support the teachers in that way, but they can't provide mentorship either. Kids are spending six hours, seven hours every day at school. Teachers aren't really capable of providing mentorship in that context with technology. They're, and the mentorship opportunities that teachers used to have, like after school programs and so on, those have been vanishing as well. So kids are not getting mentorship from parents. They're not getting mentorship from teachers. Most kids aren't involved in a spiritual community anymore. So again, it's this kind of absence of mentorship problem. Okay, it's a labyrinth to figure out, very complicated, very tricky. Okay, these transformations, all of these things are like the wave at the beginning, and I think we should recognize that nothing can halt these transformations except if a giant comet strikes the earth and we all die. <laughs> <laughs> Which could happen. Okay. So, here's the thing. It's not really any different than the past. The past has all kinds of stories about transformation and change, and being willing to leave the walled city, being willing to leave the comfort of what we know and, and what we're familiar with, and venture out into the wilderness. That's our situation right now. Okay, yes, yeah. Okay, so, some suggestions. The first thing, demonstrate some curiosity. Don't just, don't just let the kids be on the technology and you have no investment and no interest. You gotta sit down. Say, look, show me. Show me what it is that you do and tell me how it feeds you. Emotionally speaking, what does it do for you? How does it make you feel? Why is it useful? Don't do the dismissive parent smirk when they tell you, right? You have to really be serious about it, that this is something that's important to them. If you've never done this before and you try this tomorrow, you're going to say, what's up? Like, what's this? You try and give me a used computer less, aren't you? Right. You have to really show some curiosity. Particularly with gaming, you don't have to play super ultra-violent ultra -violent games with your kids. I don't think kids should play super ultra-violent games, but a lot of kids do. And, uh, but you do need to game with them in some way. You need to, if they're gamers, you've got to sit down with them and game. If, if, they're, uh, if they use social media in some way, you probably have to sit down with them and go through what, what that's all about. Get them to show you. Just demonstrate some curiosity. You can't, you can't change the environment unless you're part of the environment. So that's the challenge. You have to enter into it in some way. If, if they have online activities that you could participate in, do that. The acid test is this. If your kids send you links, they send you links and say, you should check out this video, or you should go to Imgur, or you should do this, right? If they do that pretty much every day, then you're probably doing pretty well. If your kids never send you links via email, then you're probably not doing that well with this, and you can probably do a little more. That's what kids, they, they, they communicate this way. The next thing is to talk to them about risks and benefits, like you do with traffic when they're five. You teach them how to cross a street. The web is just as dangerous as your average street in a different way. And we could do a lot more to talk to them about questions like privacy, online identity, bullying, 
gaming, violence in gaming. I had a conversation with some kids a couple of weeks, a couple of months ago, and it was about violence in gaming. It was really interesting. And they are 14, 15, and 16. And, and this game had come out, this new game that's hyper-violent, and we had this conversation, but do you think, do you think the game is too violent? And they all said, yes. They said, it's, it's, too, it's way crazy violent. But it's also very intense and engaging, and so I play it. And, and, and I feel kind of bad when I play it, because I know it's hyper-violent, and it's probably not good for me. But it's cool, too. And they, they, had, they had this very complicated, very insightful, I thought, rationale for how they got drawn into something that they knew wasn't probably, probably wasn't very good for them. It was very interesting. Kids are really good at this. The, the, I mean, the sweet spot for personal insight, I shouldn't say this, but the, the, we like to think that as we get older, we get wiser and more insightful, but that turns out to be bullshit. The, 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 the sweet spot for our insight and openness is, is not older, it's younger. We're most insightful when we're younger, really. I mean, we're, we're more open to conversation, we're more able to take stuff in, we're more able to be reflective, we have less to lose by, 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 by thinking about ourselves deeply. And I find personally that that, 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 that skill seems most evolved in kids who are 14, 15-ish. By 16, they start, to, they start to get more defended like adults are, but, but as younger than that, like 14, 13, 14, it's, it's nice, and, and it, at 10, 11, they're just starting to be able to think in a broader way. So they're very insightful, and we don't give them enough credit for this. I think if you, you probably have this experience of sitting down with your kids, the kids you know, and having very profound conversations about things if the conditions are right. If the conditions are not right, if you go in with a kind of parental attitude, if you go in with a kind of charged attitude, which they sense immediately, Right? They, they know immediately if you've got some kind of agenda that you're trying to push. It doesn't work. It has to be open. It has to be collegial and open. And they have to feel like they can share with you without consequences coming down the pike. And this is tricky with technology. Because if you haven't had conversations with them with technology, as soon as you bring it up, they know that you, you want less screen time. And that's your goal. And they're not going to want to get into it with you. So don't start with that. Start with spending a little more time. Okay. <coughs> You also got to figure out where you stand. You got to figure out where you stand with technology. Let's do a little kind of walk, walk down here. At the top end, and I mean this as a kind of hierarchy. At the top end are the people who run the world at the moment. That's the geeks. The geeks run the world. They have more power than anybody else in the world today. Does anybody know what the definition of geek is? It's a great definition. The geek is one who chooses concentration over conformity pursuit of knowledge and imagination. Great definition. Right? Great. That's what we want for kids, right? One who pursues concentration over conformity in the pursuit of knowledge and imagination. Wow. Different than nerd. Right? Geek, is the, geek is the kind of interdisciplinary, integrative, creative individual that is, is so much in demand in the world today. The folks who run Twitter, Facebook, these applications, they're all young people with lots of geekiness about them. They have a tremendous amount of power. Then, then we should we should think about this. How do we become a little more geeky? How do we become a little more open to that kind of universe? If nothing else, we could watch the Big Bang Theory and learn a couple of geeky terms and try to use them in a kind of fake parental kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> the, next, the next step down is uh, the early adopters, the people who got the iPad one, right? Um, the people who then sell it in an evangelistic kind of way to their friends and colleagues. The people who then become converted by that, and then that, then the kind of general community of fans of new technology. This is most of our kids, right? They're they're they they jump in, they buy into things, they're adaptive. I mean, I I really hate sitting down at the computer with parents and adults because it's a it's a grating experience. Um, the the I see so many people who use a computer who. Who they just, it's clear that they learn how to use a computer at some point in the distant past when computers were the kind of machine where if you hit the wrong button, the computer would explode, right? <laughs> so, so they have this sense of not wanting to click anything, or, and they do, they do the same thing in exactly the same way every time. They don't like to click around. So many people I know, they, when I say, 
if you go to a certain web page, they, they don't know how to do this. They, they go to Google instead, right? And they type in the name of the web page into the Google search bar. They don't hit enter. They go over with the mouse over to search, right? And they click it, and they see what comes up, and they click again. And just, it takes five minutes to get to a web page. And so many people do this. You gotta kind of <laughs> figure it out a little bit, right? Our kids do this. They get a new device and they just, you can watch them. They just click around. They try to break it. What the, where does that go? And go find the settings in here. And then six months later, when you say, you know, my phone keeps beeping. What do I do? I don't know how to stop the, the thingy. It does the thingy every time, you know? And there's another thingy that it does too. And they're like, you know, look in settings and go to the sub menu and, go, and they remember all this stuff. It's great, right? That's our kids. Then there's the sheep, goats, and amoebas. <laughs> the sheep are the people who, who kind of go along. Like every, pretty much most people I met in this room have a Facebook account. You have a Facebook account not because you're an early adopter, but because you wanted to see photos of your grandkids or something, right? So, so that's the sheep. The goats are the people who, they, they, they grudgingly kind of go along. They, they do it not because they want to, but because they feel like they have to, because everyone else is doing it. It kind of pisses them off. <laughs> And then the amoebas are people who, they don't think about it, they don't have a philosophical objection to it, they don't really care, they just kind of float along into it. So one of these three categories is most of us, most adults these days. And then everybody else is either a detractor, a puritan, or a bristlecone pine. The detractors, I like the detractors because they have good, strong, philosophical objections to this stuff. They say, look, this is getting out of hand. We should not use computers at all. We should, we should limit and, and prescribe what we do in a much more purposeful way than we're doing. This is wrecking our culture. Good, strong philosophical objection. I really like that. The Puritans, they, uh, they want to go back to the old way. I hear a lot of teachers and parents, too, say, you know, we should just have spiral-bound notebooks and pencils in the school. That was good enough for me. It should be good enough for you. Yeah. And the Bristol <laughs> The bristlecone pine is a tree. It grows in California, in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And it's the oldest tree in the world. Some of these bristlecone pines are 5,000 years old. That's a bristlecone <clears throat> pine. And the history, the waves of history come and go, and they just sit there, right? <laughs> Unaffected, they float by. Your average 80-year-old has a computer and an email address now, so there are very few bristlecone pines left. But there are some people who just they, they just opt out of this whole equation altogether. I think that's kind of cool. It also makes them kind of unavailable for mentorship of young people. Completely unavailable, because there's nothing they can do. There's nothing they can tr contribute to that really foundational piece of childhood development. They're kind of out of the loop altogether. But I think some people should be out of the loop altogether. But, so there's a good, strong, philosophical, or spiritual foundation for that. But um, I think it's possible it should be too far out as well. Okay, what to do? First is to educate yourself about online culture. Online culture is rich and fascinating and very, very interesting. <coughs> and and it, helps, it helps to try to get over the, uh, the I don't get it feeling. Like with Twitter. Okay, show of hands. Who just doesn't get Twitter? Yeah, a lot of people. Like, I don't get it. You can't, you can't just get it. You have to try it. You have to go into it and experience it. Twitter is a fascinating environment, fascinating little ecosystem. What's great about Twitter is that the people you respect, the people you look up to, the people in the world you admire, they're on Twitter, right? And you can follow them on Twitter. You can find out things about what they're doing or events they're going to be at or what they think about the universe and the world and everything. They're, they're, Twitter is a kind of combination of, of distance and intimacy at the same time. It's a very interesting environment. It's also a better search engine than Google. Google has, the Google algorithm, which determines search results, has been gamed quite a bit by people through testing different search parameters. And so the Google search results that you often get from Google are not the results you want, but the results that have been promoted by people trying to make money. Whereas Twitter's not like that. Twitter is a reputation-based or a trust-based environment. So you can, you can go on Twitter and find out what people think about XYZ pretty quickly. It's a very interesting environment, but you have to spend, you have to spend some time with it to you get it. If you go into it with the, I just don't get it, attitude, you're not going to get it, right? Like, like, like with a lot of things. How do you get Twitter? Do you go on Google to get Twitter? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You go to Google and you <laughs> type in Twitter and there's a link and you click it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, also.
also, the thing we should do, what I notice among most people who were born before 1990 is, it's not so much, for most of us, it's not so much technology, it's television. Television screen time too, right? And most of us are watching, I don't know, two or three hours of television every night. And that is probably too much. What I tell parents and families often is, um, ideally, uh, since kids should have, well, I'll give you the whole run, as the game happened it before. Zero to three, no screen time. Three to five, years old. Five to 10 minutes of screen time. Five to 10 years old, about 15 minutes of screen time. 10 to 15, about 20 minutes of screen time per day. Recreational screen time per day. 20 minutes recreational screen time. Is this all screen including computers or just TV? All screens. Okay. All screens. Now, they have to use a computer at school, probably. So they're going to be on the computer already doing other things. But recreational screen time, 20 minutes a day. And then somewhere between 15 and 18, it goes up to about 30 minutes a day of recreational screen time. So that is much less, dramatically less than what most kids get. Can you say that again? I'm sorry. 15 to 20. Yeah, so it's okay. zero to three is zero. I think this, this is actually all in an upcoming slide, but I'll say it. Three to five, five. Five to 10, 10 to 15. 10 to 15 years, about 20 minutes a day. And then between 15 and 18, about 30 minutes a day, recreational screen time. So what I often suggest to families is do this. Don't watch any television during the week. Zero television during the week. Zero screen time at night during the week. Save it up for the weekend and have a family movie night. We can watch a couple of movies, right? 20 minutes a day, 15 minutes a day times six days is 90 minutes. So that's a movie, right? And when you have a family movie time, it's different. You make some popcorn, you sit, you watch a bit, you pause it, you get a snack. You, you know, it's a much more of an engaged kind of experience. It's much more of an intentional kind of experience than just mindlessly watching the television every night. Um, my experience is that parents are really anxious about making these kinds of changes because it seems so large. My experience of young people is when parents make these choices, um, kids are really grateful. The kids I know who's, who have very intentional screen time parameters in their family, they're really proud of this. And they talk about it. They say, no, my family, don't, we don't watch TV during the week. You know? We save it up for the weekend. Or not, we, we limit it. And they like it. They know they need a boundary, and they can't set it for themselves, because they're kids. So we have to set it for them, and for ourselves, too, of course, right? Can I, start, can I, can I just? Yeah. How do you, like, really? Uh, I could do that for my kids. I probably could. Yeah. So I'm a, I could do that for right. all. Um, but for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the challenge, isn't it, right? That's the challenge. <laughs> that's the problem. It's us, too, right? It's a big yeah. part, and it's us. So I. Now, I, I recognize that some of the things I've said already and some of the things I'm going to say in the next few minutes um, may be way far away from what you actually do, and that's, that's fine. I don't think that you need to get all the way through to the end here. Um, I, think, I think everybody has a different range of what's possible in their families. This is the direction we're trying to go, though, ideally. So uh, turn off the DVD player in the car, if you can. Use the time to talk. Talk instead. Talk. You don't get enough talk time. Don't get enough talk time with your kids, I'm sure. So if you can use the time in the car to talk, it's very, very helpful. Young boys, here's the thing. Many, many parents experience the shutdown phenomena for young boys once they get to age 10, 11. They stop talking. It seems like it's like pulling teeth. And, and somehow boy culture kicks in, and they become recalcitrant, and they become remote, and, and you think, what the hell? What happened to the lovely seven-year-old that was so helpful and happy and woke up in the morning and it's been replaced by this sullen, angry person, right? <clears throat> it's about timing. Um, kids 10, 11, 12, 13, they need, uh, they need family conversation not to be approached directly. They need, they need to come around to it on their own time. So you need to give them at the family dinner table, you can't ask them, how was your day? You have to work around it and talk about other things until they talk about it. If there's a kind of circularity to it, it takes about 15 minutes to get to get there. So it requires a lot of time. And you can get, boys, 11, 12, 13, they love to talk about their inner life. But we have to give them the space to do it. And they don't get enough of that. Okay, on road trips, <laughs> I talked about this already. Don't opt out if you can manage it. 
Meal times, I talked about that already. Turn off devices at an agreed upon time in the evening if you can manage that. Um, and use the time to kind of finish the day with debriefing, right? They need at least an hour a day. And if you can, turn off all devices one day per week. Um, I said before I went through this list that I don't think we necessarily all of us can get all the way there. I don't get all the way there. I don't do this. I, I can't seem to get that one down, right? I have devices every day. So um, it's been shown also that quality time doesn't actually matter as much as volume of time. I mean, the whole quality time argument came out of this period where parents started to work more. Stay-at-home moms started to go to work, and there's this whole generation of familial guilt around both parents working. And the research that came out at that time was really about making parents feel better about the fact that they worked. But it's been shown pretty clearly that that you, it doesn't it doesn't make up for it if you spend better time but less of it. It's really about the volume. So the more volume, the better. Overall, year. All computers and televisions in public family spaces. I talked about that already. Recreational. There is the numbers for recreational screen time. That's the one thing to focus on. Limit screen time. You have parental authority to do so. Yeah. Now, authority. When your kids are small, you can use authority. <clears throat> By the time they're eight or nine, they have a life where they're going to assert for what they need. By the time they're 12, 13, your parental authority starts to decay. <laughs> and you have to get them to start to be mindful about developing their sense of self-regulation. I believe that if kids start from ver from infancy to be to, to be in a conversation in the family about how to use technologies, by the time they get to nine, they have pretty good self-regulation. They need to be able to sense when they've been on the computer or the screen too long, and they can do it. There's a kind of thing that you probably notice in yourself when you've been on the screen too long, which is that you space out a little bit. You get maybe a bit of an eyeball headache. You feel a little bit drifty. Kids are really good at sensing this teach them to sense it. And they will learn to recognize, oh, I should get off the computer now, and they will do it. Kids who can get this by age nine don't have any difficulty going through the rest of it. They're, they're set. They don't quite get it there, they gotta get it a bit later. By the time you get to age 15, your parental authority is worth about half the equation. You can try to use it. But they have the other half by now. And they can defy you. And they can walk out, and they can go to their friend's house and use the computer. And your parental authority is no longer the majority game changer. It can't make up the whole difference. You have to be able to negotiate with them about what they need at that age, which is a long and difficult process if they've bolted into some kind of difficult situation. By the time they're 18, 17, 18, your parental authority is essentially worthless, right? We have been taught two things which are not good for us as parents. One is that we should use our parental authority all the way through this period. We shouldn't. We should use our parental authority as the main driver up to about age 13. And from then on, our kids have to pick up the slack. They have to do more of it themselves. And that's the tough part, right? The other thing is we've been told that starting at about age 12, we should let our kids go with their friends to the mall without adult supervision. I have no idea how this got into popular regular culture and that parents and community at large thought this was a good idea. This is about the worst possible idea ever, to let gangs of 11-year-old boys go to the, the riverbank or the mall or wherever by themselves. It's just not a good idea. Bad things happen. Their impulse control is not anywhere close to sufficiently evolved to make this work. But we've been told, let your kids go. Don't be a helicopter parent. You know, let them go to the mall with their buddies. Don't. Don't do that. <laughs> the challenge is, here's a thing. If you, t if you ask a bunch of 13-year-old kids to your house for a little gathering, the first thing they're going to want to do is go on the computer, right, and game. See what games are at your house. I don't have gaming in my house, so it's easier. So <clears throat> they're going to want to go on the computer. But if you let them go on the computer for about 10 minutes, and you see what they do, let's say they're playing some kind of shooter game, and if you say to them, would you rather play this computer shooter game on the computer or would you rather go paint, play paintball? I guarantee you they will say every single time, I'd rather go play paintball. Kids want to get off the computer. 
They want to do more interesting things out in the world, but they don't have an opportunity to do it. Their parents are working all the time. The, the school doesn't provide any extracurricular activities anymore. They're on their own, and the computer's the best thing they've got. So part of our challenge is, how do we give them something other than the computer? That's the main challenge of parents. Finding ways for kids to meet the emotional needs that they're currently meeting through computer use in some other non-computer oriented way. And <laughs> we should, I particularly like the, the little bit of drool that you can see. <laughs> this is the other thing. Parents, myself included, we have been, I don't know, brainwashed, I guess you could say, it's an unkind word, but it fits, into this environment where we're supposed to be friendlier with our kids than in previous generations. We're supposed to be like friends with our kids and we're supposed to negotiate everything and all this junk. Uh, <laughs> we should be more ruthless a lot of the time with kids, especially 13 and under. Because the earlier you get this, the earlier kids get this, the easier it goes later. Right? You've got to get it really, really early. And, and we have to sometimes be quite ruthless. Don't, though, on the other hand, if you can avoid it, and you can, um, don't just take the computer away, especially if your child is over 13. That's a disaster. It's going to create all kinds of interpersonal problems. You've got to sit down with them and talk about it. You've got to get, you've got to get them to the point where they recognize and will say to you, yeah, I think it's a bit out of hand. They will because they know it. They do know it. But they feel very defensive about it. And they feel like they, if they admit to you that it's out of hand, you're going you're gonna to shut the whole show down. right? So you've got to avoid that, that kind of disaster. Have a nice, gentle, I think that all parents should be required to take counseling and training classes. right? This is a counseling conversation. It says, look, I, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to come down on you. We need to talk about this. We need to have a conversation about what's happening what's happening for you, what's happening for us in the family, and how we, how we make this work. This is a very difficult conversation for most parents to have because they're used to just saying, my authority says this, and that's it. And you can't, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for any, with technology, it doesn't work any time a child's over 12. It's not gonna work. You have to be more, it helps to be more, more uh, collaborative, more empathic, I would say, with them. <coughs> it can be really difficult to do, especially when they do that. Um, okay. Last couple of things for me, then I want to have questions. Uh, don't buy all the new fancy gear. Don't buy the story that your kids say that little Johnny has the new device, and if I don't have the new device, I will be exiled by my peers, and I'll wander lonely uh, on my own as, a, as an isolated person for the rest of my life, you know? No, they won't. Uh, so many kids I talk to today, they're, they're, they're proud. They're like, uh, they're like non-gear. They look down on the kids who have gear. Like, ah, this is like a, an early adopter. Yeah, I don't do that. I got old gear, right? Kids, it's weird. They, 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 they approach with this sense of I need the new thing, but the reality is there's a, there's um, there's a geek, there's a geek hierarchy around gear, and you don't really get to see it until you get into geek culture. But they don't need the new gear. They don't necessarily want the new gear. It becomes, it feeds that kind of ongoing addictive. That so many of us have. So, last thing. Basically, it's this. You have to do stuff. Model and encourage physical exercise practices, i.e., sports and other related things, for kids. Um, they, you know, probably already that they need about an hour a day. So, what you do is you explore the benefits they get from online culture, and you find ways to help them meet those emotional needs in some other kind of way. And I have uh, a couple of suggestions about activities that are later in, in both of these resources on the website and on here. I've talked about this already. I've talked about that. Be vigilant. You have to be quite vigilant about this. Right? And be curious. You really only need a couple of things. Curiosity is one. Um, talk, talk things through with kids. All these issues that you'll see in the online world. Talk them through with them. Um, I talked about this. Talked about that. Talked about that. Talked about that. And that. And that. And that. And that. And that. Did that. I want to get to the exercise thing. Okay. Do stuff. Okay. Do risky stuff. 
kids need risk. They don't. Uh, it's foundational to their nervous system development. This is important. The 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 developing nervous system of the child needs risk, and that's why young boys in particular want to do crazy, stupid stuff because they know they need risk. As a parent, as a teacher, you can ameliorate that risk really well by doing super risky stuff like rock climbing in a really safe way. Right? So. I'm a big fan of helping kids to navigate their own internal emotional and nervous system life through activity. That is how we're wired. That's what evolution has prepared us for, is physical activity. You can't develop the inner life, the emotionally balanced inner life, without developing a nervous system kind of